Good day, lords and ladies, and welcome to Age of Fear, the Undead King hardcore let's play with me, Cornish Knight. Now, before we get into it, I would like to say that this is going to be replacing my um, Battle Brothers let's play due to technical issues. Um, as such, this will be happening every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So, without much more waiting around, we should probably get into the nitty details of this game. This is going to be a hardcore let's play, which means the difficulty is going to be set on the hardcore mode. Also, um, there will be there's going to be some screen tearing in this video. Um, it's just to do with the fact that the developers constantly update and improve the game, and sometimes the software I use for recording has issues with it. So. Here we go. We're going to play the Paladins. Okay, let's just... Actually, wait, this reminds me. Oh, uh, yeah, here we go. Knight Edward has been stopping this green skin invasion. All Knight and Valor. However, he does not expect there to be an evil, evil waiting. And you have the Necromancer campaign, which we might do in hardcore mode as well. A lot has changed. This is like this is basically the re-release of the game. The developers have put so much energy into it that there's a lot of stuff in this game which is very different from when I originally played it. Um couple of years ago. So we're going to do hardcore mode. You can see it makes the AI more advanced, more advanced units. Um, we get more experience to counterbalance that as well. So we need to be basically playing better, thinking more tactically. We'll quickly just drop over to um, the miscellaneous section to see what additional features are turned on. Alloys block movement open world, battle menus, all that kind of jazz. Excellent. So all this stuff is like new, it has been added since I last, since I originally played the game. A lot of the stuff you will see in this game wasn't here when I originally played it. So, it would be interesting to see how much the game has evolved since I've last played it. Master difficulty, here we go. Edward, son of Borin, faced the same challenges as many young noblemen in the lands near Redcastle. As the fourth son of a minor noble house, he had not even a horse or a decent sword to call his own. However, what he lacked in material possessions, he made up in prowess, courage, and determination, as he showed at King William's hunting party. With a horse and weaponry borrowed from his eldest brother, he did his family proud. Edward's steady hand and careful aim meant that he could fell a deer at the farthest distance, drop a goose swiftly, and spear a charging boar through the heart before it could do the same to him with its razor tusks. But Edward was still forced to consider the outing a failure, for despite distinguishing himself in the hunt, he was unable to better his standing by garnering either the sponsorship of a wealthy merchant or the attentions of a well-dowried maiden. As Edward slowly made his way back to his tent, his thoughts drifted to the injustice that birth and wealth count for so much more than merit and honor. When the only foes to be had were forest creatures or tourney opponents with blunted weapons, there was little chance to achieve glory, wealth, or respect through martial skill. The land had known long years of relative peace and prosperity, with the dark times of the past only spoken of by greybeards around the firelight to frighten children. But darkness does not sleep. It only lies in wait for men to forget and lower their guards. Little did Edward know that, soon enough, social inequity would be the least of his worries, and his fortitude, strength, and noble heart would be tested to their very limits, perhaps even beyond. You can see the screen tearing there. It's just how it's going to have to be, folks. It will get fixed. It's probably something that's been knocked loose in the code. Um, so let's get on with this. Welcome to Age of Fear, the Undead King. The next few levels would teach you the base basics of the game. I do recommend you do play the introductions. They are useful and they give you run with valuable items and XP. So let's get on with it. This is the world map, folks. Lovingly handmade. It looks very, very cool. And I, um, I've seen it both in, in Age of Fear 2 and Age of Fear 3, so I'm happy to see it back in Age of Fear, The Undead King. It, I do love it. Like, it, it makes the world feel real and interconnected. So. 
Edward's chance to impress influential nobles, merchants, and eligible ladies was drawing to a close. Afterwards, he would have to return home to play the role of the dutiful fourth son to better his family's position through selfless service without regard for his own ambitions. As luck would have it, fate provided Edward with a chance encounter with the King's Chamberlain, Tybalt, an aging courtier whose eyes betrayed an incisive wisdom at odds with the foppish silks in which he was clad. Ah, young Edward, I see that the hunt holds a little challenge for you, and that the camaraderie of the other noblemen is little to your liking. I, however, offer you a proposition that may be of great interest. A boon I couldn't accept, sir. This is no challenge to entertain and amuse you, boy. I dare to presume that your father still has a light purse, does he not? And you too have little coin to spend, am I right? Yes, sir. Though it pains me to admit it, you speak the truth. Then listen to my proposition. The king wants to eliminate the goblins looming at the edge of our camp, and you could perhaps do something about them. The king is hardly without the resources for monetary reward. Edward's eyes lit up. Goblins could be quite dangerous, but they were no match for his sword. Because he was the fourth son, he had practiced harder, trained longer, and made more effort than any of his brothers. Goblins, sir. They've stolen enough game and harassed enough men that the king is willing to pay a handsome fee to the man who gets rid of them. Since you are the son of an old friend, I could see my way to granting an advance of 500 coins for you to prepare for the job. Thank you. I'd be honored. Not so fast, boy. I will lend you some armor in better condition than the shambles on your back. Wouldn't want to return you to my old friend with scratches on your pretty face, or with any parts missing. Tibble chuckled. I'd be much obliged, sir. Thank you again for this opportunity. You are quite welcome. I've seen how well you handle your sword, but I recommend you take a few of the mercenaries from camp with you. There are quite a few goblins out there. No sense risking your neck for gold if you don't make it home to spend it. When should I begin? Now. Follow me, and we'll see what you look like in a proper suit of iron. Edward followed Tibble to his encampment, filled with the heady anticipation of a real fight, and the prospect of some coin for an honest job. Not gonna lie, I, f I don't like Edward as a PC. I think at the beginning you find him to be very, very egotistical. He improves, though. Their loyal and courage of the stuff of legend knights are most often members of the nobility family, wearing full plate armor and riding battle horses. They sow no fear and serve a source of inspiration for members of the king's army. All your units will have little scripts and things. Here you have like he has um his hero motif as a hero of the army, and all the benefits and buffs that go with it. You can hover over it to see in detail. You can see his morale his um, patent of nobility, which gives him an improvement to his attack, which is useful. He's a mounted unit, and he has, he's jousting, which means that he gets plus one damage and plus three attack if he hasn't been engaged on that turn of combat, and he's charging. Um, he's coated in steel, so he's vulnerable to lightning. It's the only thing I will say. Like most people didn't wear iron armor, they wore like if you were going to wear plate armor, it was going to be steel because it was the only way to make it light enough. Um, segment segmented movement because it's a cavalry unit, and most cavalry units have segmented movement, which means that they can move half their distance and then change the angle of their attack. We can have some footmen we can recruit. We have some bowmen we can recruit. These are very basic units. Very low attack, defense values, very low speed. Um, morale and health is very low as well, as you can see in the stats. So you have to be careful with them. Um, yeah, so it's just how it is. And like the, the bowmen have even weaker melee attacks, so that's something to be taken into account. We can also rename units. That's not something I'm going to do in this particular campaign. And these are items that you can buy for your units. You can buy melee weapons. You can buy shields. You can buy armor. You can buy um, 
like jewelry or potions or miscellaneous items that can be added on. And as you can see here, Age of Fear World is full of powerful artifacts that can be only used by heroes. Artifacts can improve unit stats and maybe add new skills and abilities. The majority of items in the Age of Fear randomly dropped on every campaign is, would differ significantly. Um, that's true to a certain extent. Um, there are some certain combinations of stuff which are very nice. Um, you can also have a feature that you can add which allows um, your normal infantry, your normal m mobs Tickle's to have items. Proved true. Even a novice scout could have seen the Greenskin's tracks leading from the homestead off into the nearby woodland. However, as easy as the tracks were to follow, they still led Edward's party on quite a journey, moving from one campsite to another. Edward's party knew they were getting close when they eventually found campfire ashes that were still warm. A few more hours of travel saw them finally catch up to their quarry, who hadn't even bothered to post sentries. A few of the goblins were starting a fire and drinking their signature dark and heady grog. Remnants of what might prove to be their last supper lie strewn about the camp. Let the filthy creatures choke on their nasty ale as they die. Edward thought to himself as he signaled his men to rush the camp. I will say that grog isn't ale. It's basically normally rum mixed with water and um, f some kind of citrus juice. So that was a later thing. You did actually have a form of grog, which was wine mixed with water earlier on as well. It was a way of keeping the water fresh on long journeys. Here we come to the battle map. We found you, Green Goblins, declares Edward loudly. Boys, look, a tiny night boy, chuckles one of the goblins. A night boy, fumes Edward, you little. Oh, puny knight got angry. He needs a smack, cackles the goblin again. Edward is a knight and specialised in melee. Knights are the ability to charge. Yada yada. Yes, basically, if they are unengaged and they charge on that turn, their attacks will do more damage. That's what the pen. That's what the power of knights comes from. There will be slight screen glare. Um, tear. I should say. I do apologise, but it's just how it is. Right. So, as you can see with with units, you have two four two areas you can move into. The yellow circle is the area they can move, and the red circle is for basically their range of attack if they have a ranged weapon. There is some screen tear. It's just how it is. Right. So, we're going to go first. We have the arch. He's got a seventy percent chance to hit. That hits and kills him. As you can see here, we have the stats deploying in the top left-hand corner of the screen. We've got high morale from that, and the other goblin lost morale. We're then going to kill this one with this warrior, and we'll move our knight up to support, because um, the enemy archer is still out of range. Range units cannot move and shoot, so that's something you have to take into context. They are a very defensive unit. So we'll cut that archer down with, an, with a cavalry charge, and try and get some more experience by shooting the goblin behind with the um, range unit. Also, low morale will start to affect their, their abilities. They'll break and they'll basically have stat penalties as well. We're not wanting to leave because normally most maps will have stuff hidden on them. You can hover over objects to see or, or um, right-click on a mouse to open up the description tab menu. You can do that for units as well. Right, so we're going to smack that open. The treasure, tre treasure chest creaks. Let's see what we have inside. We have some gold. We found a pearl. A healing potion. A quality greatsword, which is very nice. Because there's certain events in the game where you can upgrade, like, common... Like, well, not common, but, like, standard non-magical equipment and make it very powerful. We just have to live that long or be lucky enough to find it in this particular um, campaign. So, that's everything. Let's end the battle. And here we go. Worthy Prey. Edward didn't have to think about his attack 
as his well-trained sword arm hacked and slashed through the forest's intruders with great ease. Edward looked over the carnage of the goblin camp. Now it was strewn with green-skinned corpses with faces fixed into grotesque masks of surprise and terror. Edward felt almost disappointed at the ease of this task. Surely not enough to make any lasting impression on the king. Even a squire could have led this party and slain this motley crew. Still, it was good coin, and he had proven he could handle a task put before him. A tracker broke Edward from his thoughts. Sir, I found the tracks of a much larger creature. I believe that cave in the distance is an ogre's lair. What is your command? I say that he will make for worthy prey. But sir, ogres are fearsome beasts. I was once part of a militia band sent to fight one, and before we could subdue him, he had killed several of our best men. Inwardly, Edward's spirit rose, for this was a worthy opponent for any knight. He didn't want to seem foolhardy and rush into peril, so he responded in a serious tone. Since we are this close to the cave, I am sure this area is part of his territory. He poses more of a threat to the folk living near this forest than that band of goblins did. By slaying him, we protect them. The tracker began to object, but Edward did not listen. He led the way up the hill and into the cave, and the hunting party followed him after only the slightest of hesitations. As they entered the cave, they nearly retched. The air hit them like a hot and fetid wall. The party slowly descended into the darkened cave with Edward at the lead, then spied the hulking figure of an ogre with crude rotting skins draped over a nine-foot wall of muscle and sinew. The beast saw them in that same moment, it let out a fierce scream and charged the party. Okay, folks, we've got our first serious engagement. What is that stench? Lord, have mercy on my nose, mutters Edward. The ogre roars loudly. It looks like the owner of this cave is home. And the ogre keeps roaring. And he'd rather, he'd rather not be disturbed. So, let's see what we're facing. Uh, we have darkness effects, which means that we have minus three to attack at range. All the units are affected on the battlefield, undead constructs and elementals. You can also bring it up on the main screen by, by basically clicking on it as well. Plants and elementals, undead and constructs are unaffected by this effect. So that's great to know. Let's see what these goblins are like. So we've got to right click. Goblin catchers are the act of the militia from amongst their tribes equipped with cast nets. Goblin catchers and snare inspecting enemies with short distance. So in snare, which is their ability, minus one to the fence and they can't move for one turn. Elementals and corporeal units cannot be affected. Okay, it's also affected by darkness, it's poison resistant and has weak melee attack, so it's not really a threat. These guys have poison resistance but none of the weaknesses. And now we have the Ogre. An Ogre is a large, cruel, monstrous and hideous humanoid monster known for its tremendous strength. Ogres can cut a huge swathe across the battlefield. So let's see what it is. It's a big target, which I suspect, yeah, it's, it's a big target, which is, means that it uh, has minus to defense. It's got disease, which means it's minus to attack and defense when it hits people with double damage, which is never nice. It's poison vulnerability to poison acid, which is useful. Which do more damage. It has a stun attack, which means minus to it to attack and minus to the movement every time it hits. Or well, fifty percent is stupid, so it gets less experience and it's weakened. Uh, it's from disease, which means it has less attack and defense. So its stats are relatively low. Like this is a training mission after after all. You wouldn't want to fight these guys at full strength because they are nasty in my experience. Mm. So let's move these units up. We're gonna do, we're gonna try and kill off the goblins before the ogre gets to us. Um. The reason being that the ogre is relatively weak, but having to face multiple units on hardcore settings will basically make them more difficult to deal with. Move up a bit more. That red mark you can see around the knight's movement is his segmented movement kicking in. Let's 
Right, so let's try and first suit this guy, and we miss terribly. So we've got to cut this guy down. Excellent. Morale is affecting them. They've lost a lot of morale, we've got to charge this guy. Goblin manages to block, which is unfortunate, because I don't really want to lose any units. But they're all going after my hero. Those, those nets miss, and the ogre continues to move up. As I said, folks, I can't help any about anything to do with the screen tearing. It's just how it is. Do not judge the game on that. It's a very good quality game. Um, and they've put a lot of work into it. Right, so we break that goblin when the netter dies, and he flees, which will mean he'll flee for about one or two turns, depending. Um, we'll move up here and cut him down with a knight, so he's just out of range of the ogre. And we'll try and kill off this goblin as well. We do not want the ogre to get a charge off on us. That would be a very bad idea. Let's see if we can suit him a bit. We managed to miss an 80% miss. That's not great. That's XCOM's levels of unfortunate coming in here. So we've got to keep falling back. We'll, get an, we'll probably get another turn off. Um, fortunately, most of the green skin faction have low morale. So if we can do enough damage, we should be able to break him. War is coming. <laughs> well, we broke a bone. That's useful. You can get injuries as well. So he loses more morale and um, his movement is reduced. We'll charge this guy in. It's a risk because if he gets hit by the ogre, he'll die instantly. But I, I wanted to break his morale, which it, it, it did, and his morale is now broken, which means we should be relatively forward, easy, well, forthcoming in running him down. To victory. <laughs> the ogre roars before dying. You can be proud of yourself, Edward, mutters the knight. You just slayed an ogre. His horse, Lucifer, looks relatively unimpressed. What? Come on, it was a huge one, mutters the young, nun, young knight. As always, you want to check the battlefield, so we've got to end the turn so we get our movement back. You want to look for objects that have the question mark over them. Um, it's a normal indicator if they have stuff in them. Or you can just hover your mouse over them and it will, no and it will tell you what's inside anyway. But it's easier to, do, to look for the question marks, in my experience. Right, so we've got to smack those open. Gold bar, very nice. Money early on will be important for the human faction because obviously we need to we will need to pay pay people to hire them because most of our forces will be mercenaries. We're not going to get a lot of free forces in the campaign. Oh, another gold bar, quality shield, rubies. So not too bad. So I might hold off on using the rubies. There's something we can do with them if we get the event which triggers us turning them into diamonds, which would be nice. And there's something we can do with silver bars as well. So it depends how much of our money we want to sell, sell straight away compared to keeping it for later in encounters. So let's end the battle. The fight with the ogre was fierce. Edward was amazed by how many deep wounds the beast could withstand before it finally toppled. The party took the ogre's head as a trophy, gathered their wounded comrades, and departed the cave. They felt palpable relief as they emerged from its fetid, stinking darkness into the sunlight and clean air. By evening, they caught up with the king's hunting party. Edward tried to remain outwardly stoic, but could not suppress his self-satisfaction with the outcome of his adventure. I've bested a mighty beast, which every knight needs to do. Still, it would be presumptuous to publicly boast of my deeds. I will surely be commended for this heroic feat, he thought. Edward ordered the mercenaries back to their area and headed to the king's banquet. You can alone. see the ego that he has in that end bit about thing he'll be he'll be clearly rewarded for it. We get an ogre's head, there's another ogre slayer, there's the feast waiting for us, but that's gonna be for next time folks. So we are going to save. Excellent. Return to main menu. And that's going to be it, really, folks. Um, if you have liked, please press the like button. If you wish to subscribe, please press the subscription button. Or check out the rest of my Let's Play series for the Age of Fear in, on my channel. And this is a very good game. Um, even with the 
the screen tearing and stuff aside, which is only happening because of my recording engine, um, I really like it. I've played this game a lot. I've played like a hundred hours of it. It's a really good game and has a lot of replayable replayability added in. And the developers are constantly updating it, so I really do suggest that you check it out. Um, and I shall see you all next time, folks, on the next episode of Age of Fear. Goodbye.